to the queue. Ah, there you go. Well, I'm certainly in trouble because I just said what I said. So what can I say? Um, so the question I want to ask to start out with is how many of you have heard about the radio amateurs code, not the Morse code, the radio amateurs code? Interesting. Good. Well, I'm glad, glad to see that some of you have heard about it. Uh, but this goes way back in, in history. Uh, if, you, if you were to take a look at, at uh, your copy hmm. of the ARRL handbook, you will probably find it in the first six pages uh, of, of the handbook. And it seems to me that we really don't emphasize this uh, very much in, as we're training new hams. And I think it is important. I know that we've talked, we talked about it a couple times when we were doing technician classes uh, a while back. But uh, it's basically how to play well with others. And uh, I think it's important. So let's see if I can make this work. Look at that. So if you go back <clears throat> to 1917, 1920, uh, what you have pretty much is like the Wild West. Uh, it, was, it was chaotic. Um, and because of what was going on, um, there was a series of articles appeared in QST. Um, and the writer was anonymous. It was the old man, T-O-M. And uh, he was concerned about that. And then you had a uh, discussion about something called the wolf hog. And we'll get into that shortly. Um, and then in 1928, Paul Siegel wrote the first draft of what's known as the Amateur's Code. One of the reasons why this is kind of important is, I mean, we all know that radio, when you're on the radio, the other people can hear. But sometimes you sort of get into the, I'm having a conversation, and, and you go, your brain goes back to what it was like when you have a telephone conversation and it's kind of like nobody else is listening, but this is, this is you're really on a stage when you're, when you're having a QSO. The world is out there. It's not just you and the other person you're talking to. Uh, everybody can hear what's going on. So essentially the code is based on, on ethics and the basic rules of ethics are essentially do no harm, do good, and treat others the way you would like to be treated. So I went searching looking for uh, a statement of values, ethical values, for engineers. And I found that at Texas Tech, uh, they, had, they have a, uh, a code of core core values and, and it basically is composed of integrity honesty fidelity charity uh on the charity side you know treating treat others with kindness the um if you want to get into theology that would be termed the buddhist would call that loving kindness and um goodwill is an important piece too but there's also responsibility and there's self-discipline um and um uh, so now the problem, of course, when you get exposed to somebody who's behaving badly, you've got to figure out how, how do I respond or should I respond? And, and there's always a problem with the potential of conflicts. Um, there are operational considerations also. The kinds of things that are problems on phone are not the kinds of things that are a problem on CW and are not the kinds of things that are problems when you get down to uh, working on the digital modes. But the, uh, but the key here is to have good practice and to, to have a habit forming uh, process of, of good practice. And um, policing means self-discipline. So the Wolf Hong is amateur radio's most sacred symbol, and it stands for the enforcement of law and order in amateur operations. This is from the 1930 handbook. Um, and the, um, it's working here. Again, the Rotten Radio series by, by the old man. 
It's a disciplinary object to uh, both flail bad operating practices and inflict punishment on the perpetrators. And uh, so there were articles about this, but it, none had appeared. And then one day, one did in fact appear at a, uh, a uh, board meeting of the ARRL. And uh, it said that when the Wolfong appeared, the directors blanched. There are actually three devices. You've got the wolf hong, the ready snitch, and the ugra monk. You know, I think that those blades really should be facing up rather than down, but on the ugra monk. So, so those are the three devices that have were mentioned over the years. So the code essentially is the radio amateur is considered never knowingly operating in a way to lessen the pleasure of others. Loyal, offering loyalty, encouragement, and support to other amateurs, local clubs, the ARRL, through which amateur radio was represented nationally and internationally. Now, I want to talk about that, that statement there. There are over 770,000 licensed amateur radio operators in the United States. Anybody have an idea of how many are league members? Hundred and twenty-two thousand. Some of the membership is Canadian. Well, yeah, that that's true. There's some internet, yeah, but and then but Canada also has its own organization too, the Radio Amateurs of Canada. So, you know, I I guess the, the, the younger generation, my guess, are not joiners the way some of the older generation are. And um, some people might ask questions, well, why should I be a member of the League? Well, the League is the, is the organization that provides a lot of the training materials that we use. The League has the, has the uh, volunteer examiner uh, organization that, uh, that we provide tests through, uh, and they process the results. The League represents us to the Federal Communications Commission when issues comes up, when, when, the, when the FCC decides they want to to sell some frequencies and some of them might be ours. It's the league that's gonna step in and try to, to, to do that, the league uh, to work on that. Uh, we are through the league and through the International Amateur Radio Union, we participate in the conferences where, and where nationally they make decisions about what allocations are gonna be available in which region. And the work bands, we got the work bands because of the league. So. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that to, to me, it's important to be a member of the league. Uh, and I would encourage any of you who are here who are not members of the league to strongly consider that. But I'll, let me go back to the other side of that. We have about 130 members now in, in the club in Albemarle. And there are over 400 members, 400 licensed hams in Albemarle. But this club draws from Orange and Green and Fluvanna and Nelson, um, you know, and um, so we, we draw from a wide, wide area. And the number of licensed TAMs in, in those counties, you know, you're getting up to 1,000, 1,200. So maybe we only have 10%. Uh, and I would hope that we would uh, get some more. Of course, I guess the other side of that, I will, I will admit that I didn't, when I first moved to Albemarle, I didn't join the AARC, but that was primarily because my focus was, was HF. Um, and I really wasn't doing much at all with VHF, UHF. And it wasn't until I was in, on a business trip in Connecticut that, um, that I stopped in at the league headquarters and I asked them, Who's the local club in Charlottesville? You know, and they, said, they went back to their three by five cards and pulled one out and said, here, <laughs> and gave me the contact information and at which one I joined. Um, the amateur is progressive. The station is kept up to date. It's well built and efficient, and the operator's practice is above reproach. This doesn't mean you 
and you've got to have the very newest modern equipment, it means that you, you are up to date in terms of the kind of signal that it produces. And as a matter of fact, there's a big effort right now uh, working the league, working with manufacturers to improve signal quality. So, uh, yes. The amateur radio operator is friendly. Now this was clearly written back when CW was a major part of ham radio. The operator sends slow and with, with patience when requested to in CW. Offers friendly advice and counsel to the beginner. Kind assistance, cooperation, consideration for the interests of others. These are the hallmark of amateur spirit. You know, I am, am very much impressed by the comments that I get from our vice director and our director. You know, when they came to field day, um, and they were very, very pleased with what they saw. And uh, they talked a little bit about the various clubs, but not being specific about them. But uh, they said, you know, that that they'd been to see us twice that I that I can recall. And we are we are a club that's that's above what they normally get. They, Bill broke it down into four groups. He says, you know, there are some clubs that you don't expect much from and you don't get much from. And there are some clubs that that you don't expect much from and they surprise you. And there are others that you expect a lot from and they disappoint you. And then there are some who you expect a lot from and they go beyond what you're expecting. And they put us in that category. So... Albemarle is a very interesting club, and I've been involved in this since since the '80s. It's friendly. Uh, it is helpful uh, to to others, um, and um, it's oh, a the antenna team. yeah the antenna team for for example the the classes that we do. I got I got an email today from from a young lady who had had a license. She was KB two years ago. And you can tell me it's but, more than five years. Ago. More than five years ago. Yeah. So yeah. And she wants to get back into the hobby. So she was asking, you know, what do I do? How do I whatever thing? But uh, you know, it's it's good. Uh, and so we sent her a response and I put that out to some other people in the club so we'd be able to to work on that. Used to be when you encountered somebody on the repeat. Remember the repeaters? You know, we have repeaters. I don't know if any of you guys use them often, but you know, you'd hear somebody's call that you didn't know, and somebody would come in and say, "How you doing? Welcome to Charlottesville. You have any questions? Can we help you?" You know, and you know, this it, it's you know, here's information about about when the club meets. If you're moving, if you're moving into the area, whatever. If you're new to to the ham radio, this is where the club meets, and all the other things that we do when the nets are, et cetera. It was like like a five minute uh, briefing to people that you didn't recognize on, on the repeater. And I hope, I hope we will continue to do that when somebody new pops up on the repeater. So, yes. So, <clears throat> um, balanced. This is something that, uh, that Harry emphasized to me years ago um, when I was, uh, when I was much younger than I am today, um, I decided that I would I would run for vice director for the Roanoke division, and and uh, I did, and I went to a couple of club meetings around to talk to people, but Harry was concerned because he said, you know, Bob, you know, you got you got a job that that requires a lot of travel, you have a family with three young sons at home. You got a wife, you know, be balanced. You know, I, he, he was really, he was hoping that, uh, wishing me the best, but saying, you know, maybe, maybe you're putting too much in. in. He could have, based on his own experience. Yeah, I'm absolutely certain based on his own experience, uh, which is one of the reasons why when he accepted the Ham of the Year Award in Dayton, the entire speech pretty much was praising Kay, his wife, he basically saying that Kay was the person who had made all of this possible for him. So, um, 
balanced. The radio was a hobby, never interfering with duties owed to family, job, school, and community. Patriotic, the station and skills are always ready for service to country and community. Um, so, the Armistice Code, 1928. There have been a few versions, the changes in it. Um, uh, some of the more recent versions take out the he's and make it gender neutral, so to speak, because I think we need to do that. Uh, but we, it really needs, uh, uh, we need to apply it to the new things that we do. There, there is a newer version that has some of it in it. And where did I put that? Yes. ON4UN and ON4WW published this book, Ethics and Operating Procedures for the Radio Amateur. Actually, it's a, it's you can get this at um, ARRL online. It's a PDF. You can download it, save it. Just just use the the title that's here. Uh, and they go into a lot of things. So if you're thinking about getting into a mode that you might not be doing any of right now, like CW or uh, some of the packet stuff, uh, there's very good information inside this about operating procedures and how to handle things. Has it been updated with John's for the sound? This is the, well, the version that's out there is 2010. It's still, it still needs to be updated further, but hopefully somebody will. So anyway. Well, that's what I have. And uh, have their own like two page ethics and operating procedures. No. No, that that's 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 basically they're still at the amateur's code. And I guess you would get closer to it with the operating manual, which is a rather large book. You know, it used to be when you got your license back in the night, well, they would send you they send you this little pamphlet. Yes. Yes, that had a lot of information and and haven't seen any of that le that yet either. So I learned about the code yeah. from AL seven D E my F my owner. Yep. Who had his pamphlet. <laughs> when I first saw the code, it was in his pamphlet that he got. Yeah. And he got his license way back. It was black and white and everything for two pages yep. like that. Yep. He still had it. Yeah, I think I think I still have a copy of mine yeah. somewhere. You know, I was looking for a, a picture from Pirates of the Caribbean and the Pirates Code. I don't know how many of you are familiar, you guys, you guys familiar with this movie where the where the uh, yeah, the, the, the they're having a pirate council and then somebody says, Well, what about the code? You know, and uh, so suddenly the the a voice comes from the background. And Keith Richards, who is playing a pirate, comes out with this gigantic book, <laughs> and they put it down on the table. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's important. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to... Um, it's like operating practices and ethics or something. Like yes, that. yes. So here's some of the new sections that are in the IARU um, thing that aren't talked about in the amateur code. And um, so I want to, want to wish you good DX and a great experience in here, Randy. So. All right. Is there, oh, wait a second. AJ's got stuff to give. How much money do we have? 31 at the moment. Uh, should I be like the past?